Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Robert Coho Epstein. It's the Heart Sutra, the distillation of the great um, Rajnaparamita, Perfection of Wisdom Sutras, says that form is emptiness and emptiness is form. You could say that form and emptiness are in a way uh, synonymous with each other as, or occurring simultaneously in every experience as the two aspects of experiencing itself. And at the same time, you could say that they occur on a spectrum, that some experiences and understandings emphasize the nature of form and that some are more about the nature of emptiness. So in Zen, we have the practice of really focusing on the moment and being very present in the detailed reality that we are engaged with. And that's uh, really a keynote of Buddhism in general through the practice of mindfulness. Um, and that's one way of being very much in tune with form, the physical world, the world of beings and bodies, is to take body, mind, and feelings and unify and align them in the performance of a physical task. And uh, that's done through attention to ordinary activities as well as the work component of, of uh, monastic life in a Zen monastery, which is optional for lay people. But we all do some kind of work. In one sense, breathing meditation brings us more fully into our experience of physical presence and helps us be more aware of the here and now and away from rumination and imagination. So in a way, it's taking us into this current physical situation, into the body and into the present experience. And if we're fully engaged with any ordinary activity, washing the dishes or shoveling snow, and are not separating out to complain about the difficulty of the task or getting bored and impatient with what we have to do or just thinking about something else. But we are fully engaged with body, mind, and senses. It brings us into a powerful, appreciative experience of form, of the physical world, unified with the physical body, and with the mind supporting the experience by being present to the task and fully engaged. And that's also a pretty good rudimentary definition of mindfulness as we generally think of it. And it also implies that even though good or bad does not really apply to an experience or to the unified experience, it becomes more of a pleasant experience than an unpleasant one if we're approaching it that way uh, without wishing we were doing something else or complaining about it. Uh, Buddha said of the unified experience that it was that the unified experience was a pleasant experience in terms of meditation. And this brings unification off of the cushion and into our everyday tasks for a more pleasant and fruitful approach to living. We're always doing something, so why not really do it? Uh, dukkha or dissatisfaction comes when we separate out from what we're doing. And there's a, that subtle dukkha of always wondering if we're doing the right thing or if we should really be doing something else or if we should really be somewhere else or what we did in the past wasn't quite right or what we do in the future isn't quite working out the way that we think it's going to. Um, that's all erased if we're completely unified mind, body, and emotions with what we're doing. Even if we're hot and sweating in the sun trying to push a car uphill, I've had that experience. Um, if we're fully committed and unified with the task, our thoughts and feelings become part of the support system for what we're doing And mind, body and feelings are in harmony with the physical world and the physical task. Strangely enough, when we're unified with form in this way, the sense of a separate self can disappear or become less apparent. And this full commitment to form can give us the experience of emptiness or formlessness. Because when there's no separation, we just experience being present rather than experiencing a separate self and separate objects. 
So this is one way we can look at form being emptiness or opening up into the experience of emptiness because the experience of form as form is dependent on our separating out. As Buddha said in the Bahá'í Sutta, when in the seen there is only the seen, when in the heard there is only the heard, when in the cognized, he even included thought, there is only the cognized, then there is no self here, there, or anywhere else. This, just this, is the end of stress. And it's interesting, uh, just as a side note, that Thich Nhat Hanh uh, echoed this uh, self being neither here, near there, anywhere else, when the monks uh, were very upset that he was dying and wanted to build a, a giant stupa, a giant monument to him. And he said, I don't really need that. It's a waste of, uh, of, the, of the property here. But if you have to build it, put a plaque on it that says, I'm, I am not in here. <laughs> and I'm also not out there. <laughs> and so then you can build it. Um, so full commitment to form can relieve us of the separation of separation of form into objects, entities, and selves, and allow us to experience form as the formless. This also reminds me of uh, Dogen's statement that when we, uh, when the self experiences objects, that is delusion. But when objects experience uh, <laughs> I forgot the quote. That's what I get for doing things off of off of my head. But anyway, if if the, if if we're not taking the self view of separate objects, and instead the our enlightened self is awakened by every object, something to that effect, um, that's enlightenment. Um, so I will repeat: full commitment to form can relieve us of that separation of form into objects, entities, and selves, and allow us to experience form as the formless. When there's no separation from form or within form, just the doing and seeing, then there are no separate eyes, nose, ears, body, or mind, to quote the Heart Sutra again, a little bit paraphrase. There's just the experiencing of what is in a unified and undefined manner, and that is to say form is emptiness. On the other hand, we also have the practice of deep meditation that really takes us away in a sense from the concrete experience of form to a certain extent and takes us more deeply inward in what could be said as a more direct experience of formlessness. In the jhanas or dhyanas, the Buddhist system of deepening levels of samadhi, one gradually pays less attention to outer form and enters the mindful experience of subtler and subtler levels of form and ultimately more formless states. Um, some of which could be called formless form, which is a term I would like. Uh, one could say that on that continuum, replicated in longer Zen sittings in a natural way, that one goes from an experience of outer form to inner form to formless form. And sometimes one can then rest in the experience of just being present. Again, in that experience, the constant barrage of the senses and mind can subside and leave one with the experience of a kind of open emptiness that is free from the usual impingements. And that is a very pleasant experience, a relief or refuge from the busy world of form. But that experience is still taking place in the framework of the human body and mind and is temporary. And when we emerge, we find that the emptiness is filled with and expressed through form. And that is emptiness as form. We cannot turn emptiness into a separate object sitting next to and apart from form. It's not an alternative to form. Emptiness becomes seen as a quality of form rather than as a separate experience. In the Zen koans, there's also a continuum of stories or propositions that focus more either on the pristine nature of form and then the pristine nature or reality of emptiness. In the koans of Zen master Joshu, there are two koans that bookmark this continuum rather clearly. The first one is like our unified experience of form leading to the experience of emptiness. It's the famous story of the monk who asked for instruction in Zen and Joshu said in brief, if you've eaten your rice, wash your bowl. This aspect of Zen taking care of form in an appropriate and mindful way echoes our earlier discussion of unified activities and Zen is also very famous for that, you know, doing things in a very mindful and uh, 
specific way, uh, tea ceremony, uh, very meticulous. Um, if you're one with your given activities and how they are executed and resolved, then you complete the action and it's completely done. There's nothing left to worry about and no stray pieces left over to take care of later. One can cleanly move on to the next action. So I have ruminated in the past, uh, what would it be like if we really did everything that way? You know, eat your rice, wash your bowl, end of story. Things would be kind of nice. Uh, it usually doesn't work out that way. There's usually a lot of loose threads to pick up and try to untangle later on. But that's a it's a nice model for being with form and being in harmony with form and taking care of business in a way that doesn't leave a lot of residue. So that's one aspect of Zen, uh, dealing with form in that way. This aspect of Zen taking care of form in an appropriate and mindful way echoes our earlier discussion of unified activities. And if you are one with your given activities and how they're executed and resolved, then you complete the action and it's then completely done. I'm repeating this. There's nothing left to worry about and no stray pieces left over to take care of later. One can cleanly move on to the next action. And that also means that one's experience of form is seamless and unseparated and once again, allows us to enjoy the shine of its emptiness because we're not getting stuck or hung up on those uh, aspects of form that seem even more concrete when we butt up against them instead of going with them harmoniously. When we're busy mixing things up and leaving them undone, they come to trouble us in, in a way that makes form seem very solid. When things are taken care of skillfully, they leave nothing but emptiness within and behind them. It's like having something stuck in your throat, which makes it seem very prominent until you swallow it, or something that goes down easily because you've taken reasonable bites. That's a metaphor from my own life. And then it's almost like it doesn't exist in a way. It just happens. It's like a stream that seems like it flows very easily as opposed to going against the stream and feeling the pressure of the stream working against you and having to use force to get through it. I don't know if any of you have ever had that experience of feeling like you're resisting what's going on and trying to push through it, but it's not that pleasant. Then on the other end of the spectrum is the nature of emptiness itself, which is signified in, in Joshu's Mu Koan. The launching point for the famous Mu Koan is the question as to whether a dog has Buddha nature. And Jusha, Joshu says Mu. Mu or Wu in Chinese is a tricky term because it can sometimes mean in context no or not or nothing, but it's also used as a negation of a term. So then it would be translated kind of as non, as it occurs in the term Wu Wei or not doing or non doing. This famous Chinese phrase points to the use of emptiness as a way of interacting with reality. Not doing doesn't mean to be perfectly still and not do anything. It means that one is once again going with the flow of action and sometimes stepping back rather than stepping into a situation in order to let it resolve itself. It's a letting go of control, letting go with both hands, and having a mindful, harmonious relationship to what's taking place. And I'll throw in, uh, if we're having a mindful, harmonious relationship to what's taking place, we're kind of experiencing the emptiness of it rather than butting up against the form of it. And there's a, a further uh, discussion to be given about how this relates to guest and host, but I'm not going to get into that now or I'll get in a lot of trouble. But uh, I think it's an interesting footnote. Um, as Lao Tzu once said, very simply, in action, watch the timing. This idea that one doesn't always jump in and take action and always be the doer trying to make things happen, but can wait and see and take action at the appropriate time and sometimes not do anything at all. And that is a very fruitful uh, way of being that calls for more awareness and less blind activity more cooperation and less forcefulness, more letting go and less control. 
And I see those qualities of letting go and being less forceful and being more harmonious and going along with things as uh, the embodiment of emptiness in form in a way. Dwelling in emptiness, non-doing and harmonious awareness is the embodiment of the empty nature of self and reality and allows us to interact from a different perspective. What if in an argument, just to take a different angle, I were to dwell in emptiness and see that there's nothing to argue about <laughs> and let the other person completely vent their view, what would be left over? Just emptiness. The energy would complete itself without my interference. Many years ago, my grandfather uh, decided to be nonviolent. He was living a kind of a rough life. Uh, it actually was uh, a hobo uh, traveling around the country at that time. And some guy picked a fight with him and started punching him. Um, he refused to fight back because he had made this decision that he wasn't going to fight anymore and uh, apologize to him. Um, well, I don't recommend getting punched as a way of experiencing uh, uh, non-doing. Um, it's a stark demonstration of non-doing and participating from the standpoint of emptiness rather than form. Form as form always calls for a resolution in the form, but emptiness sees that form is self-resolving if left to its own momentum. So when we meditate on Mu or Wu, we see that Joshu was pointing to our own self-nature as empty or non-self, Wu being not or non. If we related to Wu as it's formulated in Wu Wei, we could get a sense of non-doing or not being a discrete separate self that is taking independent action. If we dwell in this sense of not defining ourselves and our world through form as form, but as emptiness, and as emptiness expressing itself in form, we may have a more mindful and harmonious perspective. In the 10th ox herding picture, having realized the nature of emptiness and the emptiness of nature, just to turn it into acute uh, reversal, we return to the marketplace and take our place as an ordinary person, but without the dukkha of separation and misidentification embodying the meaning of Wu as the empty nature of self and Wu Wei as the harmonious emptiness of action. <laughs>